Hey everybody, it's Taylor Sparks again. I'm back with another video in our materials informatics series. Now today I'm really excited to talk about the composition based feature vector. Blech, what a mouthful, right? So what on earth is this thing? Why do we need it? How do we use it? How do we create it? Right? That's what we're going to cover in today's video. So first off, why do we need it? Well, first off, before we answer that question, I have to set it up by saying that um, we already as humans know how to featureize something based off of a chemical formula. For example, if I give you the chemical formula Al2O3 or Cu2Zn or C2F4 in repeating units, you already, because you're a human that has experience and domain knowledge as a chemist or a material scientist, just as a person, right? You kind of already know some things about those. You know that Al2O3 is a ceramic, that it's hard, it has a high melting point, it's strong. You know that this Cu2Zn is brass, that it's a metal, it's an alloy, it has sort of an intermediate melting point, it's ductile, it's pretty corrosion resistant as metals go. Whereas this one over here is a polymer, it's non-stick, it's low melting point, it's low friction, it has, you know, these things have properties that we're just familiar with. So the trick is how do we teach our machine learning models to recognize these same things when they're not humans, right? As humans, we have experience, but they don't. And so how do we allow it to do that? Especially when you consider that what we're feeding it is really a list of characters, right? AL203, different lengths. You know, we recognize key elements here. How do we teach the machine learning model to recognize those and use those in an informed way? To do that, we have to have the composition-based feature vector. So how do we do it? By far, the most common way to do it is to take each individual element that's in the formula and look at the individual element properties, right? And then combine those together in some sort of way. So for example, here's, you know, from hydrogen all the way up to silicon, but we could keep going. And here are what, nine or 10 different columns representing material properties. Uh, is it a metal or a non-metal? Is it a metalloid? What group is it in? What period is it in? What's the atomic number? What's the actual number in the product table, right? On and on. We could have hundreds of these things, okay? But you would start with something like those and you would say for each compound, the first step would be to take this formula, right, which is made up of multiple different elements maybe, and I would very first I would normalize it to one, right, because right now it has five different uh, elements per formula unit, but if we're going to be comparing lots of different formulas, they won't all have five. So let's normalize it to one element per formula. So in that case, we've got 0 0.4 atoms of aluminum and 0 0.6 atoms of oxygen. Okay, great. There's two different uh, atoms in this formula, so great. We can work with those, two different ions technically, right? So we could say for oxygen, here's some of the properties maybe that we care about, whereas for aluminum, it has slightly different ones down here. The, the way that we're gonna build our composition-based feature vector is by taking a mixture, like a, we're, gonna, we're basically gonna add these up. It'll be like the average, right? We're gonna take this first column, we're gonna say, okay, you've got eight for oxygen and you've got 13 for aluminum. So let's take eight, times the prevalence of oxygen, since oxygen is present in 0 0.6, right? 60% of the atoms are oxygen. Then we're gonna take 60% of the one for oxygen here, uh, sorry, up here, eight. And then we're gonna add that to 13, because that's the number for aluminum, times 0 0.4, which is the prevalence of aluminum, right? So there we did it. We have one entry in our vector. If you add those up, it comes out to be 10. And then we'd move the next, the next column over. So this time it's 15.9 and 26.98, so here we go, we've got 16 and basically 27, right? And you could do this for every single column for all the elemental data you've got, right? When you combine those together, at the end, you end up with this really fancy thing. You've got this vector, right? It's an array, right? It's, a, it's this vector representing all these values in a list that is a unique, hopefully, unique representation of what it means to be AL203. And it includes chemical topics, right? The number of electrons, uh, period, you know, ionic weight, uh, ionic size, all these different things, right, could be encoded into there if you have those for all the different elements. That's how we construct, in the most basic sense, a composition-based feature vector. So if we do this, does this actually work? Does it put things that are chemically similar with things that are chemically similar, right? One way to do this, consider that this is a vector. Now this one, it's however many columns we have, that's the length of the vector. So, you know, what do we have here? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this would be a nine dimensional object. We can't plot that, right? We can plot 1D, 2D, 3D, but we can't plot 9D. But imagine a hypersphere, which is, you know, nine dimensional. The vector for AL203 would be pointing in a line somewhere in that space, right? You could point a line if you did it. Just like with XYZ Cartesian coordinates, you can point a line to something. You can do the same thing in high dimensional space. And one would expect that a material that has similar properties would have two vectors that are pointed almost the same direction. 
In fact, the distance between them, we call that the Euclidean distance. One would expect the Euclidean distance to be small between these two vectors, right, if they're similar. Well, we can actually see this sort of thing happening. When we project our composition-based feature vector into a reduced dimensional space that we can actually see with human eyes, in two-dimensional space, for example, we take this nine-dimensional or however many dimensional space, and we flatten it into two dimensions by looking at a projection, right? And we'll talk about how we can do that with clustering and different projections later in this video series, but here's what it looks like. And right away, you see that the trends sort of hold, like here's our noble gases, you see where the alkalines together, you see where the rare earths are together, you see where some of the transition metals sort of cluster together. Things cluster that are chemically similar to one another, so it looks sort of like this is an okay way of encoding some sort of chemical domain knowledge into our process here. Then we get this really cool approach. We can take compounds, right, because this was for pure elements. When you take compounds, they show up sort of in the middle, right? NaCl shows up sort of in between sodium and chlorine. Al2O3 shows up between aluminum and oxygen, and so forth. If you've got a three-component system, great. It shows up kind of in the middle of those three. So this is the an example of how the composition-based feature vector can work for pure elements and now for compounds, and you can start to see that similar things are close to one another. In fact, this is one of the early approaches that they used for predicting properties. It's called nearest neighbor, right? The nearest neighbor approach simply says, like, okay, let's say that we don't know what the properties are for this compound, Al2O3, but we do know what they are for NaCl. Well, one approach for predicting the properties of Al2O3 would just to say, well, give it whatever properties of the thing that's closest to it. <laughs> this works actually surprisingly well. It's like, it's not terrible how well this works, right? Now we could do better than this though, like, cause it's not just close to NaCl, it's kind of close to calcium carbonate. So maybe it's sort of a mixture where you'd have to say it's a little bit close to that, it's a little bit close to that. So maybe it's a little bit of those two properties put together. And this gets to the heart of some of the simplest approaches for materials informatics, where Again, we're trying to predict a property for some unknown thing. The first thing we're going to do is take a bunch of known things, our training data, right? We're going to generate a composition-based feature vector for them. So now they have a bunch of X values, right? Then we plot them against their known property, right? Whatever the property is, whether it's melting point or whatever that we're, we're trying to eventually predict, we can now plot this. And it might be a scenario where it's a simple linear relationship. Not always, <laughs> it's oftentimes non-linear, but let's imagine a scenario where it's a nice linear relationship. Well then, when something new comes in that we don't know the, the, the target for, right? Well, we can go ahead from its chemical formula, we can calculate X, the composition based feature vector. And then we can say, because we fit a nice line to this, well, great, because it fits, you know, right about here on the line, we can predict that it would have Y value for its material property, right? It's as simple as that. That's the idea in a nutshell of materials informatics. So now the catch is that it's not always a simple linear relationship. In fact, uh, these things can get pretty gnarly. They can end up with really complicated relationships, okay? Now, we were not the first to do this, obviously. This has actually been done for quite some time. Early, back in the 80s, Pierre Villers, who, uh, like the Pearson database, he created this. Pretty awesome guy. In 1983, check this out, in the uh, journal, the Journal of Less Common Metals, he has this really cool work going all the way back, you know, 30-ish years ago, almost 40 years ago, where they were taking, and they were saying for different compounds, right, the ones that crystallize in the sodium chloride structure, for example, right here, versus the sodium titanate or whatever that is, um, he would plot on the X and the Y axis aspects of those chemical formulas. Like he would take the differences in size or the difference in electronegativity or the difference in whatever. And he found that materials that had the same crystal structure sort of clustered together. And all he had to do was sort of draw these boundary lines between them, which is exactly what machine learning models do for us today, right? Machine learning models can just do this in a much more complex way rather than dealing with just two variables, right? And just drawing sort of by best approximation the lines uh, a human doing this, we can have algorithms do this where they can draw this differentiation lines where this is now a certain structure and this is a different one, or this is a high melting material and this is a low melting material, right? We can do this now in high dimensional space because computational resources have just gotten better. But I think this is so cool because here's an example of somebody who for 40 years took the main idea of materials informatics and was doing it just with low tech capability back then. So. Nowadays, we have lots of options for doing this and doing it really well. Let's think just for a moment about the composition-based feature vector. I showed you sort of in a nutshell how it works, but there's several different flavors of tools out there that people have built. I think one of the very first ones was actually Jarvis. Jarvis comes from NIST, what, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. Um, 
And then there's Olyanik. This comes from my friend Anton Olyanik at the uh, Manhattan College in New York City. Great chemist. Um, there's Adam Tavek. There's Matt Tavek, sort of just a couple years old. Magpie's been around for quite a while. All of these things are essentially doing the same thing. In comes a chemical formula. Out comes a big vector that hopefully has some sort of chemical knowledge wrapped up in that vector that makes it useful. Okay. So how do they differ? How do they work? Uh, let, let's actually walk through some of those. Well, Jarvis, Magpie, and the Olyanik, they're really all based off of the same concept, which I showed you previously. You have your elemental, you know, table of all these different elements. And for each one of those elements, you know, here's one from, I think it's like periodictable.com, where if you click on copper, here it's showing you all these things about copper, right? And here it's showing you, what, 10 or 12? But there's hundreds, right? You can find hundreds of chemical properties on a per element basis, put those in a big spreadsheet, and that will be the basis for using Jarvis, Magpie, or Olianix uh, data set. Let's show you what they look like, the actual data. Okay. So here I've pulled up the GitHub page for my grad student, Ka'ai. He was able to go and find the individual data for all these different approaches. So this is the, uh, the spreadsheet for Jarvis, for example. And if you look at this, for every single element, it has all of these different columns, right? Now, I don't know offhand what these things represent, C-14, 15, 16, right? Uh, you could go to the original paper where these were published, and you could see what they correspond to. But it's just a bunch of individual element properties for these things. That's what Jarvis would look like. Coming over here to Olyanik, it would look something like this, All right? Atomic weight, period, families, it's sort of what I showed you previously, the electronegativity, the valence, the number of electrons of different varieties, the specific heat, all this jazz that's encoded in there, right? So for these different approaches, they're really based off of tables of these different elemental properties, okay? Now, Matt Tavek is different. Matt Tavek came out a couple years ago, 2018, I think it was. Um, it is very different. In this one, they had the clever idea to take um, and do word embeddings to capture chemical domain knowledge, right? So the idea was this. If you were to have all the abstracts of all the different sort of chemistry papers that have been published, what if you could take and you could look in those abstracts and do word embeddings to figure out what things are related with other things? For example, when this formula shows up, copper 9.1, tellurium 4, chlorine 3, well, it is found in this abstract, what, three or four or five words away from this polymorphic compound, right, phrase, and it's found somewhat in presence of this word thermoelectric, right? So what you could do is you could use the, the natural language processing tools of word embeddings to actually capture all the relationships of all of these words to everything else, right? And ideally, if you have domain experts writing these abstracts, then they should be able to sort of put chemical knowledge into words and we should be able to extract that knowledge with something like word embeddings. That's the concept, right? So for example, if from the word thermoelectric, they are correlated with these sort of words and those words are correlated with these sort of formulas. And so you can form those linkages with word embeddings. The details of how this work are in the paper. Um, briefly, I'll show you what it looks like. They basically said here, right here, they've got this figure one. It says word to vec, skip gram and analogies, right? So they have two uh, target words and they're trying to show you that when, it, when you take the the written sort of domain knowledge and you embed that in a vector, they look pretty similar, which makes sense because lithium cobaltate and lithium manganate are both used as battery cathode materials. They have sort of similar properties in that regard. So they start out with your input layer. This is one hot encoding. This is basically all the words that you're going to see in the abstracts. In this case, they would, I think they had 500,000 vocabulary words. If the word is present, then you put a one at that location if that word is present, right? They then do deep learning, right, to actually learn the relationships between when these things are present. It goes through a softmax function, which is really just a way of normalizing your data so that it goes, then it's a, it's a probability distribution basically between zero and one, right? So that now you can end up with this probability, right? Context word probability. If you have some input, right, for some word, what's the probability that it will be, you know, in in vicinity to words like cathodes or electrochemical or thin or properties or magnetic, right? And you can see that these materials, because their chemical formula makes them pretty similar for these applications, they end up with pretty similar vectors after it's gone through this word embedding process, which is pretty cool, right? If you take, uh, here's another example, 
where they take three elements, uh, the word embeddings for zirconium, chromium, and nickel, right? So here's zirconium, chromium, and nickel. They're, they've shown this in first principal component and second principal component. So again, you have this high dimensional vector, which is hundreds of, you know, hundreds in dimension, and they're projecting it now into just two dimensional space. So to do that, they do something called principal component analysis, which we will talk about later, right? In any case, these three things show up here, here, and here. And then when you actually do the word embeddings for their oxides, they sort of cluster in one direction, right? The oxides of those three things sort of go the one direction. So that's oxides of these materials. Whereas if you look at their structures, they sort of go the other way. The structure of those materials go the other way. So this does seem to be a pretty clever way of embedding things where all you have to do is give it a formula and then it should be demonstrating the ability to actually learn some chemical domain knowledge through word embeddings. Pretty clever approach. Um, nowadays, by the way, this was based off of word to vec and nowadays transformers have really revolutionized this field. So I'm sure people have already taken that next step of doing mat to vec, but with transformers. But um, I'm not sure if I've seen that article yet. It's probably out there, I just haven't seen it. Okay, so that's mat to vec. There are of course other ways of embedding chemical domain knowledge. Here's this one. This came from uh, some people, this was Joe's work in conjunction with Shou Cheng Zhang, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. Um, sad story there. In any case, their concept was this. This was published in P PNAS. I can't, unfortunately, this is an example of materials informatics done wrong in my opinion, because the code and the data is not available. And we've never been able to reproduce this and get the results that they got. So make your code available. Anyways, here's the concept. They basically said, okay, we're not going to use the, the elemental properties of the individuals. We're not going to use um, word embeddings. Instead, what we're going to do is this, take databases with all of these known materials that actually exist because somebody's made them before, right? So maybe in your database, you end up with this Bi2Se3 compound. And then this was their approach. They said, all right, if you have all of these database of materials, right? In all of those materials, how often do you find bismuth present with two of itself and three of selenium? Well, you certainly find it once here. And if you find it in other compounds, then you could do, you know, you could indicate it as such. You also find bismuth with two of itself and three of antimony, or you find it with two of itself and, and three of tellurium, right? And so they build this sort of like one hot matrix of when you find different elements with other elements. Now they use the word environment and they show this picture which makes you think that it's actually taking into account like coordination number, like crystal structure environment. It is not. That's a, I think it's a little bit misleading here. That's not what it is. It's just saying that in the formula, how often do you find one element with some combination of other elements, including itself and other things, right? You then create a vector based off of this and that's what they trained off of. So the concept's not a bad one. I think it's a clever idea, but in practice, because the code and the data is not available, um, it's not that great. Uh, we can't reproduce it. Um, anyways, but that's Adam Tvek. Okay. Um, again, they show that it works great, that things that should be clustered together end up clustering together. We haven't been able to, be able to have that much luck with this and this isn't very widely used because the code wasn't ever given. Okay. Then there's the approach uh, called LMNet, which is really just like a simple one-hot encoding of the feature paired with deep learning. So in this case, you're just doing one-hot encoding. So you're saying, I'm not going to tell it the melting point, the atomic number, the electronegativity, any of that stuff. I'm just going to give it a big, long vector. And if your element is present, then you put one in that spot for that element. And if it's not present, you put a zero, right? That is one-hot encoding. So different materials will have ones and zeros depending on whether different elements are present. They then feed those things into a very deep network. I think this was like, I can't remember at the time, it was like 17 layers. Yeah, 17 layers deep with a, a number of different nodes. So it's pretty deep. There's a lot of parameters here and it can just make a property prediction. The cool thing about this, as they sort of show in this graphic here is like normally you start with these data sets and you have to do feature engineering based off of domain knowledge, which is what I've been talking about in this video. You have all this domain knowledge about number of electrons or blah, 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 blah. And using that, you're then able to build a model and predict things. They're basically saying, you don't have to do that. Now, in the what's, you know, nothing's free in this world. How can you get away with avoiding this step of feature engineering? Only if you have a ton of data. If you have a ton of data, then yeah, it can do pretty well. So if you look at like this paper, the way that they actually did it, um, the number of data they had to train off and the depth of these layers as those got you know deeper and deeper models sure enough they did get lower and lower error but it did require more and more data and so if you don't have a lot of data this isn't a very great tool okay so that's uh some of the different ideas for composition based feature vectors okay i hope i've explained some of those at least sort of adequately
Now let me ask the question here. Will a composition-based feature vector based on domain knowledge do better than one that doesn't have domain knowledge? One would argue, at least it would make sense that adding all this chemical domain knowledge should make you uh, more likely to be able to predict things. Well, that was the exact subject of a paper that we published, what, last year. Uh, the lead author was my, he was an undergraduate, Ryan Murdoch, now working at Adobe, phenomenal guy, brilliant materials, uh, not a material scientist, he was a data scientist, but a brilliant guy. We set out to answer this question, you know, is this domain knowledge necessary? And if so, like, to what degree is it necessary? Does it really make it a lot better or not? So one thing we did was a series of different ablation studies. Ablation studies is, I think it comes back from like the 60s when they would literally take like rats and bunnies and stuff and they would ablate, they'd like destroy part of the animal's brain and then see what part of its function like stopped working, which is horrific, right? But we are doing that to our machine learning models. We're gonna intentionally destroy part of the, the feature engineering process and see what it does to our model, right? So for example, Jarvis, Jarvis, like normal would look like this. Well, what if we intentionally mess with Jarvis, right? What if we switch some of the rows, right? We take the values for neon and we swap them with magnesium or take the values for sodium and we swap them with silicon and so forth like that. If we swap some of these rows, then we are killing some of that domain knowledge which was so carefully added. You should expect to see a reduction in the performance right? If domain knowledge is really an important thing here. And fortunately, as a first sanity check, it does. It does worse, right? Jarvis without swapping is up here in blue. Here's the, this is the R squared. So it's basically like model performance. Um, we'll talk about metrics later, but you've got your model performance is better than if you swap these things sort of randomly among the elements. Not surprising, but a good sanity check. Okay. So it does look like it's helping a little bit. Well then, which one of all of these is sort of the most useful? We, in this paper, went to great lengths to compare things apples to apples, meaning the same data set for everything, the same architecture, right? We didn't change, like, we gave one model super tons of super deep learning capabilities because we gave it lots and lots of layers and many nodes. No, we tried to make them all the exact same to have a really good, fair comparison. And here's what we see. So fractional encoding, that's one hot encoding, basically. That's our baseline. So what you're seeing is the average improvement over fractional encoding, one hot encoding versus the amount of data available. So the best one we saw in the limit of low amounts of data, like 100 data points, we found that the Oleanic data set or just featureizer, right, was the best one. It gave us the best improvement, followed by, you know, Magpie and, you know, Jarvis and Matt Tvek and so far down, right? In fact, um, some of them, like Adam Tvek did no better. And as you increase the data, Adam Tvek actually did worse as did, you know, randomly selecting values, right? actually did slightly worse than fractional encoding, right? Which is very unfortunate. At a minimum, you should do no worse than, you should do no harm, basically. And this is like showing it's doing harm. But another important finding is that, look at these. As you go from 100 data points to 1,000 to 10,000, you lose all the benefit of your domain knowledge. Basically, you could just do one hot encoding, right? Like LMNet did. And by the time that you've got 10,000 data points, in these examples that we did, you're basically not doing any better, right? Which is pretty interesting, okay? And you can see the same thing in R squared, um, okay, that they just get better and better as you give it more and more data and domain knowledge becomes less and less important as you have more and more data. Now, because material science so often is in this regime, 100 data points or less, feature engineering can give you big improvements relative to not feature engineering. So that, that's a pretty important takeaway here, okay? Another thing we realize is that a lot of times when people do these feature comparisons, you know, this feature set, this uh, Magpie versus Jarvis versus, you know, whatever, they, they're not very meaningful because they only report the best value. But just take a look at this. This was from, I can't remember what data set, but we, we chose one of them and we just split the data 15 times randomly, right? And randomly, here's the variation in R squared. We got every, from as low as just under 0.6 to as high as, you know, 0.7 basically. So there's essentially 15% variation just came from randomly splitting your cross uh, validation set. And what do you think people report? They only report this top one, which is silly, right? It would be much better to report the average and the error bars on there. That would be a much more honest way to report and compare things, right? These different uh, composition-based feature vectors, okay? Um, one thing we actually tested was whether or not these feature engineering can allow us to extrapolate, right? Extrapolation is a big part of materials informatics. We want to actually extrapolate out to new compounds, new chemistries. So here's what we did. I think in this case, we held out the element tungsten from all of the training data set, right? So it never saw tungsten as a training data set. And then we had it predict compounds that had tungsten in it. And here's what you see. So one hot doesn't do very great. It has some R squared value, okay? 
um, and random does no better, but all of these that have chemical domain knowledge do much better. And that makes sense because, you know, when one hot and random, when you introduce tungsten, that's just a spot in their vector they've never seen before. And so it has no point of reference whether that spot should be correlated to anything else. But Magpie, Olyanik, Matzevich, Jarvis, all these other ones, even though they've never seen the element tungsten before, as soon as we introduce the properties of tungsten, it says, oh, well, this property vector, that looks a lot like this property vector for niobium or, you know, tantalum or whatever else. And so it has the ability to find things that are chemically similar because we, you know, have all these chemical properties encoded into it. So here's a great example of domain knowledge making it better, okay? All right, so last thing I'm going to show you is that this composition-based feature vector process, you could go to the each of these individual websites for Matavec, for you know Olyanik, for Jarvis, and you could pull those up one by one and figure out how to work them. Or we made life really easy for you. We actually created, I say we, it was my grad students, Andrew Falkowski, uh, um, Kawei, and Anthony Wang. They uh, built this CBFV, right? Which you can just pip install. You can just go pip install cbfv and what it will bring is all of this stuff from my student kai's github for cbfv right into your python environment so you can work on it which is going to be really awesome let me show you how it works because it's really simple okay when it installs it again it's going to be installing this package from here this github.com kaian cbfv and it has this really great readme that talks about how to use all this stuff it's pretty awesome let's show you how it actually works in python Okay, here we are in Spider, and I'm going to do a really simple example of this. So first off, from CBFV, that's the thing that we just pip installed, I'm going to import composition, okay, which is going to be a lot, it's going to allow us to actually generate this composition-based feature vector. I'm going to import pandas just so I can build a data frame. So first off, I'm going to take, I'm going to create data. If you had an Excel spreadsheet, you could just import it with pandas. But in any case, I'm going to say that data is equal to SI102, and then some target property, whatever that corresponds to, strength or whatever, right? AL203 with some property, and then hafnium-1, carbon-1, zirconium-1 with some property, right? And you could make this as long as you want, but here's just an example, just three different elements coming in, or three different formula coming in with some sort of target property for each of these. Now, to use the composition-based feature vector that we constructed for you, it's really simple, but you do have to have a certain format. When you create your pandas data frame, it has to have very specifically named columns. One column has to be named formula. That will be this column for these different strings. And one column has to be target, which is, you know, whatever your materials property target is, okay? So I'm gonna create a data frame by sending it this data and telling it to name the columns formula and target. So let's run it up to here so far. So F9, just to run that portion of it, we come over to our variable explorer. And sure enough, we have a pandas data frame where we have formula and target these are just strings, and these are some sort of target representing a material property that we care about, and we're going to try and predict, right? Well, great. To go ahead and generate a composition-based feature vector for these three, you know, for these different strings, we're going to do the following. We're going to say x. That will be our our vector. Our, our it's going to be a matrix representing the every row will be a different chemical formula, but represented as a big long composition-based feature vector, right? So this will be an, a, a big matrix made up of a series of these vectors as rows, okay? Y will be a new matrix representing our targets, right? It's gonna, it's gonna take this target value and peel it off and make it into the variable Y. Um, formula and skipped, I can't read those are for now, <laughs> but they, they're there. You can read the, uh, the uh, GitHub page if you wanna read more about them. Well, to do it, all we do is composition, dot generate underscore features and again it's, it's documented as it does a pretty good job of telling you what you need to actually put in here you have to send it a data frame here's our data frame which is called df and then you have to tell it what element property to use in this case we want to build our composition based feature vector based off of olyanic but you could have put magpie or matt tevec or whatever else here right so great now that you've done that we can run the whole thing it doesn't take too long it's pretty fast you know featureizing creating and then sure enough at the end you get this Here's our new data frame. It has three rows because we had three formulas initially, but instead of just being a single you know, cell with a value there, we now have, what? This is 100 and something. You know, it's 264. This thing has been, we have all these different chemical properties and you can see what they all are. So now you have a way of representing your 
individual formula as a composition based vector feature vector and it's so simple and again if you wanted to change this and not do oleanic but you'd rather do you know mat to vec or whatever it's pretty simple to change that and then just run it again no problem spits it out this time notice that the dimension has changed because mat to vec has a different number of columns right in its data set that it uses it's 3 by 1200 but it's the exact same approach. So this makes your life really easy. Um, you're going to be once you do this, you're now going to be able to do machine learning in a much simpler way. So we hope this is a useful tool for you, tool for you guys. If you have feedback, shoot us an email, drop a note in the comments, and say, "Hey, this is rad. Thanks for building this." And I'll send the word along to my grad students. Or if we messed up and got something wrong, tell us that too, and we're happy to fix it. Okay. In our next video, now that we've covered how to do a composition-based feature vector, stay tuned because in the next video, we'll show you how to do structure-based feature vectors because composition's great, but it's only part of the story. Structure, crystal structure also matters. And then you can actually bring these two together and include both composition and structure, and you get sort of the most powerful way to represent materials. Okay, we will catch you next time.